Well, good afternoon again, and uh, thank the organisers for inviting me. Apologies right at the start, I'm not going to give the paper for which there is an abstract amongst your pack, partly because uh, it was unexpectedly taken over for a different publication. I didn't want to uh, 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 duplicate things too much, and partly because I came to the conclusion that I didn't entirely believe what I'd said in that paper, uh, which often happens. Uh, if anybody wants a copy of it, they've just got to email me and I'll send them a copy. It's to do with uh, how it is that the human mind can be supposed to model the cosmos and how it is that we so easily expect there to be humanoid aliens out there when, honestly, if there is life out there, it is on the history of the Earth more likely to be either bacterial or insect. Uh, so human beings don't, biologically speaking, come out very, as a very likely uh, end point of natural evolution. However, I'm not going to give that paper. Instead, I'm going to talk about one of those texts which uh, is there in the background, which people have been glancingly referring to uh, several times now, and Andrew indeed has spoken about. Uh, God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now, the phrase in our image, after our likeness, um, is very likely simply a rhetorical doublet. However, both in rabbinic and patristic literature, the two were distinguished. In our image, selem, after our likeness, demot. Um, being in, our being in God's image is, uses the expression which is used by potentates, or is used for potentates, for the statues that they erected around their empire. The statue stood for the emperor. Human beings stand for God. Uh, and to disrespect the statue was to disrespect the emperor, and to disrespect a human being is to disrespect God. And that actually is the main use that the metaphor has in the Hebrew scriptures. Um, it's not the dominion point, which Andrew has already discussed. It's much more that every human being, every individual human being, is owed respect as if he were God. He is God's, he, she is God's representative. And the quotation I've given in the list of quotes from the uh, Mishnah, a man stamps many coins with one seal and they are all identical. For the king of the kings of kings stamped every man with the seal of the first man and none is identical with his fellow. Therefore it is the duty of everyone to say, for my sake the world was created. And to disrespect any one, male or female, of human beings is to do dishonor to God. Which incidentally is also the point of the curious reply that uh, Jesus is said to have given to the point about uh, shall I pay tax to Caesar? And uh, on producing the coin, he says, well, it carries Caesar's head, it's Caesar's image, so it belongs to Caesar. Give Caesar what is his and give God what is his own. And what is his own? Every individual human creature. It isn't a, a recipe about dividing the church from the state. It is a flat statement that every individual human being is to be respected as if he were God. Not because thereby he gets dominion over everything, though that remark, for my sake the world was created, which incidentally Thomas Traherne, a great mystic poet, also says, you don't see things right until you see that everything was made for you and everything is full of the glory of God and you were there to enjoy it. Um, but chiefly, that respect is owed all individual humans. The same respect that in other kingdoms, other empires, other cultures was owed only to the king or to the priest. So this is a really radical statement in its beginning. It says all human beings are to be counted as royal. Well, there's the claim about being in the image. What about in the likeness? Well, that says the original human being was like God. But rabbinic and patristic literature both instantly add, and he has lost that likeness. We're not like God. Uh, we lost that, rather strangely in the story, by eating of the wrong tree. There was the tree of life, 
And there was the tree of, what's the obvious alternative? Well, knowledge of good and evil, which brings death. So we chose, our ancestor chose, humanity in our ancestor chose death, a certain form of knowledge. And we are condemned by that because we've lost our likeness. So what are we to do about it? Well, again, working from rabbinic and patristic literature both, we are called to recover a likeness. We are to be holy. We are to be perfect as God. Now, what does holiness mean? Well, it has an inevitable con connotation, I think, both then and now, of purity, being separated out, being cut off from things that might distract us. However, the rabbinic discussion of the, the quality specifically emphasizes compassion. The, the, the Hebrew is kadosh. Um, we are to be compassionate. We're not now. We're not like God now. We are called to be like God. We are called to be holy, to be pure, to be compassionate. Not to be distracted from that compassion by our particular uh, lurch of desires, our particular sensations and the, our own self-indulgence. We indulge ourselves in things. Well, we're not to. We are to be compassionate. Well, um, that's nice. Uh, how exactly do you get back to that? How are we to recover the likeness? How are we to become compassionate when, frankly, much of the time, we're not. Uh, I know that the current uh, surge of uh, sociobiological literature now tends to emphasize that human beings are sometimes quite nice to each other uh, and can cooperate. Um, I, personally, I, I, I feel this is almost more dangerous than the line they were taking back in the 80s, which was that all human beings are absolutely bound to be selfish and greedy and uh, uh, all human societies are bound to be run on extreme capitalist principles because that's the way we are. Um, the idea that we are all nice doesn't seem to me to hold water. We're not nice. Uh, Andrew had a rather uh, uh, vulgar phrase for it. Uh, Food shits. Well, I'm not sure about that. Uh, but yeah, actually, I am sure about that. Um, uh, we're all sinners, and if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Uh, if we really did love our neighbor as ourselves, which is the instruction given specifically in Leviticus, you shall love your neighbor as a man like yourself. I am the Lord, who says it. Uh, well, we behave extremely differently than we do. Uh, even nice people, and of course some people are nice, I don't deny that at all. I'm not one of them, but uh, some people are nice. Uh, even those who are nice do not, in fact, love their neighbor as themselves. They would behave very differently if they did. So we're not nice. And the question is, well, we're told to be nice. No, no, that's the wrong phrase. We're told to be holy. How exactly do we do it, and what is the direction of our holiness? Well, the, uh, 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 in a way, I'm, I'm now going to say something which almost repeats what Andrew has just said, and I apologize, um, not because it's, it's wrong to repeat what Andrew says, but because <laughs> it gets a bit tedious if the speakers say the same thing all over and over again. Uh, I would much rather say something strange than new, but I can't think of anything. Um, the, 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 the picture does look as if we are to be compassionate towards human beings. That's what I just said, after all. Every human being, every individual human being, male or female, is royal, is to be accorded the same respect that in other cultures the king or the priest should get. We are to reverence every individual human being as in the image of God. Dogs, cats, cattle, sheep, mosquitoes, jellyfish, sea squirts, sea slugs. They're not in the image of God by this account. Uh, they're not royal. They don't get that respect. But of course, being royal doesn't mean being top. Doesn't mean having your own way with everything. It means, it meant quite clearly, that that was a, although that's a possible perversion, 
into the perversion that the prophet Samuel warns the people of Israel about. They come, they come to him and say, we're a bit fed up. We haven't got a king. Everybody else has got a king. We need a king to speak for us, to stand for us in the general council of nations. And Samuel says, you don't really mean that, you know. You don't want a king at all. Kings will tyrannize over you. Kings will rule you with a rod of iron. Kings will cheat you and oppress you. You don't want a king. Yes, we do, they said. I want a, we want a king. So they got a king, and the king did exactly what Samuel has just said. So kings do that sort of thing, but that's not what the sort of kingship that is being described here. The sort of kingship that is being described here, the sort of royalty that is being described here, is the royalty of being available. Royalty as generosity. Royalty as helping along. Royalty as sharing in the royalty attributed to God. So, to be compassionate doesn't just require us to be uh, respectful of humanity, it requires us precisely to be compassionate, to suffer along with the entirety of creation. Now, I said a moment ago that uh, we lost our likeness to God in the story, very oddly, by eating of the tree of death, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Which, when you think about it, is rather strange. Because the thing that uh, um, other part of the tradition, the patristic tradition, the philosophical tradition in the years since has done is to say, well, image and likeness do, after all, mean much the same thing. And it does, it, what it says is that human beings are, belong to the same class of entity as God. What, does that, what is that class of entity? Well, it's the class of rational beings class of beings who can think things through, who are not bound by their immediate parochial sensations, who can reason their way to eternal truths. Or perhaps it's not that they're not so much that God and, God and ourselves are rational, but that God and ourselves are free. We're not bound by the particular situation and nature in which we find ourselves. We can choose we can choose to do step outside the ordinary framework. And that's what the likeness is. The likeness is that human beings are free, like God. Or perhaps it's not that either. Perhaps it is that human beings are like God in being able to have conversations, meaningful conversations with each other and, gosh, with God too. So in all these respects, human beings are now being subtly described as being like God, in the image of God because they're like God. And they're like God in being rational, free, knowing good and evil, being able to choose, being able to have conversations, to notice that, oh, gosh, we're naked and uh, there are some leaves over there. We could uh, deck ourselves out with those pretty quickly. Uh, those are the ways we're suddenly supposed to be like God. But no, we were created like God. We lost our likeness. We lost our likeness in the story by choosing to know good and evil, to be like gods, as the serpent said. So this is a rather strange backwards and forwards story. Is it, is it godlike to be rational, to be free, to be able to have conversations? Is that what constitutes us as a superior sort of entity in the world, a, an image and likeness of God, unlike the other things that aren't images and likenesses? Well, possibly. Um, there is a story which is actually spelt out rather more in the uh, in Muslim tradition than I think in the rabbinic, though I, I, it seems like the rabbinic too, is that... Uh, um, when God decreed that Adam was his viceroy, one of the angels disputed this and said, this is ridiculous. You can't mean that. Uh, I'm not going to bow down before a creature made of flesh and blood and bones and doing all sorts of disgusting things in a biological universe. Uh, I won't. And that angel is the fallen angel, Satan, Iblis. Um, one of the things that God did to show the angels, at least to convince the other angels, apparently, um, that uh, Adam would do, 
as his viceroy, is that uh, God asked the angels to name the other creatures he had made. And they didn't know what, what the names were. They didn't know, that is, what the names and natures of those other creatures were. But lo, Adam did. Adam named the other creatures. That is, he knew what their specific natures were. And God said, there you see, Adam, humanity, understands the nature of things already. Why? Because I... Uh, actually, I gave him the crib sheet. Um, I didn't give that to you, you angels. You haven't got the crib sheet. You don't know what's what. Humanity knows what's what. Humanity knows already because I've made him like that. I've made him, her, them like that. They understand the nature of things. So what is it that the Adam doesn't know until this drastic moment when he, he she, they eat the fruit to the knowledge of good and evil. They already know in the story what things are. They've already named the creatures. They already know the names and natures of all the creatures in the, in the, in the cosmos because God has slipped them the crib sheet. God has told them. What they don't know is which is good and which is evil. They don't, at that point, make a distinction between the good creatures and the bad creatures. The ones that are to be treasured and the ones that are to be treated as vermin. The category of vermin comes into play. They know now as gods, as the serpent or Satan or Iblis would have them know, they know some creatures, they experience some things as vermin, as dangerous, as disgusting. Before that, they didn't. Before that, they knew the creatures and they knew they were all good. They knew that all creatures were good. There are no vermin. That's the delusion. The delusion that our humanity has fallen into, according to the story, that such that uh, we distinguish between good and evil, good and evil creatures, and we despise some of them as vermin, as dangerous and disgusting, but they're not. A later book of the Bible says, God hates nothing that he has made. Why else would he have made it? But oddly, in that very same book, it's the Wisdom of Solomon, uh, it goes on to talk precisely about vermin. And uh, the author is particularly pleased to notice that God engineered the downfall of the Egyptians through vermin, through lice and frogs and other such lowly creatures. Whereas God could have engineered the downfall of the, of, of the Egyptians by all sorts of magnificent and lordly creatures, but he chose to show that they were really feeble before him by doing it with vermin. Now, I take it the author is actually speaking of a, a, a slight lift of the eyebrows. They're not vermin. They are God's creatures. The lice, the mosquitoes, the frogs, and all the rest of them are not vermin. They're God's creatures, just like other creatures, things made by God be enjoyed and to enjoy their own life. The point that that author is making, though, is that it's a very familiar theme, in fact, in all Mediterranean culture, except, of course, Egypt, uh, that the Egyptians were really peculiar. The Egyptians were really peculiar because they did give reverence, sacred reverence, to non-human creatures, to cats, to ox, to birds, they gave to those creatures the respect, the worship, which most other Mediterranean peoples, not just the Hebrews, thought should be given only to the human figure. So, the Egyptians were odd. And you find that being stated not just by, in the Hebrew scriptures, but in the Greek writings and in the Roman writings too. That's what's odd about e Egypt, that they reverence other creatures the same sort of worship that others give the human. So it's a common theme. And it's because it's a common theme that so many moralists of those early patristic centuries, both Christian and Jewish and purely pagan, back away from the, anything that suggests that they might be prepared to reverence the non-human. And that's really a very interesting question. Why, if what I've been saying is more or less correct, that the world is created as a whole, as good, that all the creatures in it are creatures of God and to be shown compassion and are to be acknowledged as, as uh, 
images in another sense, reflections of a divine beauty, which is a common statement. If that's right, why, why are they so nervous about reverencing the non-human? Well, I think the answer is, is straightforwardly moralistic, again. And I've given a, a quotation from the great uh, Stoic uh, philosopher Epictetus. Consider who you are, he says. In the first place, you are a man. You are human, anthropos. And this is one who has nothing superior to the faculty of the will, but all other things subjected to it. In the faculty itself, he possesses unenslaved and free from the subjection. That is, subjection to impulse, fear, desire. You're human. I'm human. We are all, Epictetus tells us, in charge. We are all able to disregard our fears and immediate desires. We are all able to see what is right, what is good, what is beautiful, and to do it. We really are, he says. Consider then from what things you have been separated by reason. You have been separated from wild beasts. You have been separated from domestic animals. And in Epictetus's vocabulary, that, what does that mean? You have been separated from the impulses of rage and anger and homicidal fury. And you have been separated also from the emotions, the impulses of fear and quivering docility. You have been separated both from the wildness, the aggressiveness in your heart, and from the fear and subservience in your heart. You're not those things. Because you're not those things, in, and I'm not those things, in myself, I stand above, you stand above those things, I am able, he says, to choose. And admiring animals, in this vocabulary, is giving in, is admiring just those impulses of, on the one hand, aggressive rage, and on the other hand, those impulses of fearful docility, which he wishes, and which most of the pagan philosophers, as well as the Hebrews, wish to dissociate themselves from. So animals are presented in their moralistic aspect. And to put up statues to them, therefore, as the Egyptians did, in the eyes of pagan, Hebrew, Christian thinkers, was to encourage in themselves just the kind of passions and emotions that we ought to be able to stand over against, to judge, to discriminate against, to look past. So that's why the non-human is rejected and disregarded. It's rejected and disregarded because it stands for the things in ourselves that we are told we can, should disallow. Well, it's a dangerous strategy, I think. Uh, and for two very obvious reasons, and I will simply state them and uh, conclude. The first reason why it's a dangerous strategy is exactly what historically has happened. Because we have told ourselves that these creatures stand for, embody passions that we ourselves ought not to give into, we treat those other creatures not with compassion, but with contempt. We typify them as, once again, vermin. We stop thinking of them as the good creatures of God. We line them up as evidencing the bad things that we ourselves wish to get rid of. And even when we don't do that, even when we notice that some of the animals actually behave uh, in ways we admire, they are faithful, uh, they are brave, they are affectionate. Uh, somehow those very, the very fact that they do it too suggests that they're not quite, they're not quite the holy emotions we should be feeling because they're far too much bound up in our own bodily feelings which we know to distrust. So that's one unfortunate feature of this moralistic exercise. It has taught us to disregard the message which comes through so strongly once you start seeing it there, uh, namely that all creatures are good, all creatures are to be respected as such, and that our office is as being in the image and likeness of God is to appreciate their beauty. 
That's the first thing that's dangerous. And the second thing is, of course, Epictetus was wrong. He said, I stand above, you stand above our passions. You can do it. Well, that's a bit like telling uh, somebody who is clinically depressed, oh, come on, you can snap out of it. Cheer up. As one of my friends used to say, and I was all sad and depressed, and a little voice said, cheer up, things could be worse. So I cheered up, and sure enough, things got worse. <laughs> or it's like telling an alcoholic, oh, you can do it, you can have a little drink, and just one little drink, and stop there. It's like telling an anorexic, Oh, there's no problem here. It's a perfectly good meal in front of you. Why not eat it? Damn you. Eat it. The anorexic cannot eat it. The alcoholic cannot have one little drink. The clinically depressed cannot just snap out of it and be cheerful. And I'm sorry to admit, I cannot say that I am a superior to all the passions that inhabit me. Uh, so I cannot do this thing that Epictetus tells me, of course I can do. So he's wrong. Sorry. And that does suggest again that we need some other recipe than this. We know we are called to be holy, that is compassionate. We know we are called to see the beauty and goodness of things. We know these things. It doesn't just because it's in the Bible. These things, I suggest, are known to everybody. They are part of uh, the natural endowment of humanity. We're almost born knowing there is such a thing as beauty and that we can be beautiful. There is such a thing as compassion and we can be compassionate. There is such a thing as seeing the beauty of everything. We know these things and we also know that we're not doing it. So, on that extremely downbeat note, but with a hope that somebody will tell me, oh, actually, Stephen, you're quite wrong. I hope. Call a halt. Thank you very much.